is there is freedom in Christ. There is freedom in Christ. And as I approach the subject of freedom, looking in the scriptures, uh, we've got to figure out, well, what are we free from? If we're free in Christ, what does it mean to be free in Christ? Uh, and I come to the conclusion when looking through this, Christ frees us from the bondage of the law. And right there, it might sound like we're saying that the law is bad. I mean, read what Paul says about the law in Romans. You'll see, no, never, may it never be. I'm not saying that the law is bad. The law is good. The law has its place. It's important. The law is a description of God's holiness. The law is not a bad thing. But in a sense, there is bondage to the law. And we can see that in what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians. In 3.10, it says, for as many are of the works of the law are under a curse. And also in 5.1, the law is described as a yoke of slavery. So people who are under the law are under this yoke of slavery. They're under this curse. So what does it mean to be under this curse is going to help us understand what it means to have freedom in Christ. So a few things I want to point out about being under the law. How does the law produce bondage? First thing here, Romans 7, 8 says, But sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. So in a weird way, the law even helps generate and stimulate some sin in us. When you're told not to do something, it ends up happening. You know, for, let me give you an example of this. I'm going to give you a commandment here, and I would like everyone to obey. I know what you're thinking. Who made you watchtower, right? <laughs> right? No? So here's the commandment. Do not, do not think about your toes, Okay? I do not want anyone here to think about your toes. Don't wiggle them in your shoes. Don't wonder if there's a hole in your sock down there. Don't wonder if your friend next to you can smell them. Just don't think about your toes, okay? How many of you broke that commandment? Almost all of us. You focus on the law as a way to clean yourself. It helps draw you back into that sin of where you are. So just to focus on the law, the law arouses sin, according to the Apostle Paul. Next slide here. Now, I'm on shaky ground with this crowd here at this point, so please let me get through this before you tar and feather me, okay? Because you're just there's two ways to be saved in the Scripture. Just hear me out as we work through this before you, before you gauge whether I'm right or not. By grace from Jesus, I think we'd say amen to that, but the next one also, the other way, is through good works. We'd probably say amen through the first one, but the second one, I think is true as well. Some of the quotes that we read from the um, You Can Have Everlasting Life on Paradise Earth or that other Watchtower magazine, I think actually there's an element of truth there to them. Good works are a way to save. And the, many, the number of works you have to do, what they said there, are true. By avoiding all practices that are against God, that's what you have to do. And the Bible backs this up as well here in this verse, in Galatians 3. Ten, it says, for as many are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. And then again in Galatians 5, 3, every man who receives circumcision, which is a mark of the law, is under obligation to keep the whole law. So if you want to be saved, well, you can do it by works of the law or you can do it by grace. Those who are under the law have to remain under the law unless they get out from Jesus, and this is what they have to do. So there are, though there are two ways to be saved, next here, there is actually only one standard, perfection. And you can't mix these two. It's not like, okay, well, I have works and Jesus. That's what many people try to do. Let's mix these two and have them both. No, you can't do that. It's one or the other. There's one standard, perfection. You've got to have either one. Which one are you going to be able to do, grace or good works? Next. So the law arouses sin. The next one then, the law requires too much. Now, the next one here, the, the law restricts your motives. Now, in order to describe this, what I mean by the law restricts your motives, I want to tell you a parable that I've come up with. I'm going to call it the parable of adoption. And this parable is based on a true story of a friend of mine uh, who lives in Chicago. And uh, I want to introduce you to him. His name is Doug. These are not, now that's not a real picture of him, and his name is not really Doug. I've changed the names in this story, but we're going to call him Doug the dad. Doug wanted to be a dad in the beginning, 
he and his wife really wanted to be parents, but they weren't able to. They weren't able to conceive for whatever reason. They really tried, and it just didn't work out. So Doug, with his desire to be a dad, entered into the world of the foster care system and had some placements in his home. In this next slide, you'll meet our next fellow here. This is Foster Adam. Foster Adam come, came into Doug's home and lived there with him and really enjoyed living in Doug's house because Doug was very committed to being a good dad, teaching Adam about the world, about life, about God, taking him to church, providing for him a nice home and a safe place to live. So Adam really appreciated and cared about Doug and probably even came to love Doug. But one day, something really important happened. Doug and his wife decided that they wanted to adopt Adam. So Doug did the necessary groundwork. He filled out the paperwork. And uh, when the day came, went down to the courthouse or wherever you do this thing. He walked down and he signed his name on a piece of paper, adopting Adam. And now this changes things for Adam. Now instead of foster Adam, his name is adopted Adam. Okay. For Doug... Now that Adam is adopted, it doesn't really change his relationship with Adam. Now, I'm sure he had a big celebration and a party when he got adopted, but it didn't change his love and respect and desire to have Adam as a son. But for Adam, things change drastically when he becomes the foster, or not the foster, but the adopted son. See, before he was adopted, he might have called Doug dad, but it was only a contingent designation meaning it, is, it could be temporary. It might change. Maybe he might have to go into another foster care home. Maybe he might have to go somewhere else or to, to like a, a facility where other kids are and have to live there. So he might not always be Doug's son, but now that the papers are signed, it changes everything. Doug's dadness is permanent. Now enter our next character. Uh, this here is Foster Frank. Foster Frank came to live in Doug's home after Adam was adopted. And just like it started with Adam, he came to appreciate Doug. He liked living in Doug's home. He liked what he had been learning from Doug, enjoy being in a good home. He doesn't want to go back in the foster care system and uh, be placed somewhere else. He likes being in this. You know, some foster care uh, parents will get into the foster care system for the money of it. I mean, how would you like to, to get someone like that as a parent? So Foster Frank, just like Adam, would want to stay here in this placement. But one day, Frank did something bad, and it was really bad. I'm not going to go into the details about what he did, but I guarantee you if you heard what he did, you would agree with Doug. Doug had to call the foster care people and ask, um, ask them to have Foster Frank removed from the situation. So slide, Frank moves out. Okay, so Frank has to fade out of the picture because of something that he did that was very bad. And I'm sure it broke Doug's heart because he's a good dad. He wants to care and provide and teach and nurture these kids. And he had to have Frank leave. But what I want to do is have us now step back just a little bit in time. Let's take, let's take him back. Next click here. Let's bring Foster Frank back. And I want you to help me think through this relationship that Adam has to Doug compared to Frank. And this can help us illustrate what it's like to live under the law. Doug is a good dad, wants to teach his kids respect. Ability. So he gives them chores. Now, many kids wouldn't think chores are a good thing, but they are because it helps kids learn about responsibility and how to take care of things. And I don't know what kind of responsibilities they would have, maybe mowing the lawn, taking out the garbage, but let's just make this easy. They have one chore. They each have their own room, and they have to clean their room. Let's say both of them clean their room, and they both do it perfectly. All right. Now, I'm not crazy. I have three kids of my own. They don't clean their room perfectly, not even marginally, usually, right? But let's just say for argument, Frank and Adam do this. They do a great job. What are their motivations? Why do they do this? Now, Foster Frank probably really appreciates Doug. He likes living in this safe home, this safe environment, this caring father, this loving family. And so his appreciation for Doug is going to help motivate him to want to do his chores, keeping his room clean. But there's something else behind his motivation which will be there a little bit of self-preservation. He doesn't want to go into the foster care system. And who could blame him? I'm not saying Foster Frank is a bad guy for having this motivation, but being in his position, he's helpless to not have this kind of motivation. If he wants to stay in this home, he has to keep his room clean to try to please Doug the dad. 
Now, I doubt Doug the dad would actually say, you've got to get out of my house because you're not keeping the room clean. But does Foster Frank know that? You can't be sure. When you're under the law, you have to be paranoid about how well am I doing in each area. Well, we heard about the guy, uh, was it yesterday, the story about uh, on the deathbed, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses on the deathbed asking their, their elder, do you think I've done enough? And that's the attitude of Foster Frank, perhaps, maybe in the back of his mind, maybe not consciously thinking about it, but his desire for self-preservation has tainted his motivations for following what Doug has told him to do. But he's missed the point now. Doug the dad, remember what I said? Why did Doug give him responsibilities? To teach him responsibility and maturity. Foster Frank can only exhibit the rules on the outside. Internally, he can't mask them. He might have even fooled himself that those internal motivations are not even there. But they're there. So on the outside, he's learned to mimic responsibility, mimic maturity in its fullest sense. But what about adopted Adam? Do you think when Doug went down to the courthouse and signed his name on the line, Adam went, Wahoo! I don't have to keep my room clean anymore. You know how many times when I have explained the gospel to someone, they said, Oh, so does that mean that I can just go out and do whatever I want? Now that I'm free in Christ or whatever? And I tell them, Well, you know, for me, I guess, yeah, I can go out and do whatever I want. And what I want to do right now is come out here and tell you about God. I mean, that is really what I want to do. See, when you get saved, when you're released from the law, genuine, and I mean, there's hiccups down the road always of sin and this and that, but generally it produces in the hearts of God's followers this desire to love and please him and move forward in that relationship. And I'm sure that's what's happened with adopted Adam. It would be the same thing for him. Doug signs his name on the law or on the adoption papers. Adam's heart now rejoices in his relationship with Doug, the dad, it's a concrete thing in his life now. His dad loves him. He has signed his name on the paper. He doesn't have to worry. Now, the only proper motivation for him to cleaning his room now would be for maturity, responsibility, and to please his father. That's what he wants to do, and now he can do it. Frank can't even obey the law because he's under it. Isn't that interesting? When you think about the motivations, you cannot obey the law with proper motivations when you're under it. Only when you're released from it are you able to even follow the purpose of the law that it was given, to understand God's holiness and his character and become holy like he is holy. And people who are not under the law have been adopted by God. Galatians 4, 4 through 6 says, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his uh, son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And that's a permanent designation. When you are saved by the blood of Christ, when you accept Christ and his love and his forgiveness, that's not a contingent Abba, Father. That is a permanent one. You are released from that law. So what we looked at here is how does the law produce bondage? It arouses sin, requires too much, and it restricts your motives. Now, we as, even as Christians, we don't have this perfect doing. We, light, we slip back into works mentality. We mix in some bad motivations here and there. Just like think of Adam. I'm sure maybe he wants to stay up late some night and watch TV, and so maybe he might clean his room to kind of manipulate his father. Look what I've done, Dad. Now can I... But his proper motivation can now be to keep the law for good reasons. And it is now for us as Christians, though we slip back into works mentality as well. But Paul says that God has adopted us. We are not under the law anymore. We are freed from that. When Christopher Columbus discovered America, his goal was not to discover America, as we know. His desire was to find a new trade route from Europe to the Far East. Problem was, he found this great big land mass that stopped him. So he sails over there in 1492, finds this big land mass, and the idea of finding this quicker trade route didn't die. People still wanted to find a faster way to get to the Far East. For over, well over 100 years, people were still looking. And uh, there was this one theory they called the Northwest Passage. They believed, many of them believed, that if you sailed from Europe, and then as you see on the arrow there, go up past Greenland there on the west, and if you go far enough north, get past 
all of these tiny little islands in these icy waters. If you go far enough north, then you can come down south, down into the Far East, the Northwest Passage. Well, many people believe this. And uh, there was an explorer by the name of John Ross in 1818 who attempted the Northwest Passage. I'm not sure exactly how far he got or if he was successful, but he attempted this. And uh, as he made his way up these icy waters, as he comes up on the uh, west coast of Greenland, up the Baffin Bay, he comes to the city of Thule. Thule is the, one of the, the northernmost points on the face of the earth where there's been any civilization found up until this point. Thule is about 900 miles from the North Pole, just to show you how incredibly north it was. About 100 miles north of there is where the polar ice cap starts. So very cold, very icy. But as John Ross's ship makes it past Thule and up about 100 miles, they discover a little town called Etah. And these polar Eskimos living in Etah were kind of stuck there, stranded there. They don't even know how they got there. Theories were that maybe through some period of warming on, on the earth, migrants of people moved up into that area, and then a period of freezing came, and then they were trapped and locked into this area. They were stuck in this place. They didn't know they were stuck. They didn't know anybody else existed. Any record of anything in their culture was gone from anything before them. They were stuck there. In uh, the book by Alvin Simons, uh, North Tonight, he gives an account of what happened with Ross as, uh, as he sails. It says here, until Ross and Perry's ship with its giant wings had appeared from over the horizon, the secluded Inuit of Etah, the polar Eskimos, 200 strong, had thought themselves the only human beings on earth, a philosophical perspective almost too profound to imagine today. When Ross's ship appeared, the inhabitants of Etah thought, of, thought it was a marvel of ingenuity and described it as a whole island of wood, which moved along the sea on wings, and in its depth had many houses and rooms full of noisy people. Little boats hung around the rails, and these filled with men were lowered on the water, and as they surrounded the ship, it looked as if the monster gave birth to its living young. And I, I love this next count here. The English officers presented a ludicrous sight, standing in full dress regalia with polished and pointed shoes punching through the soft snow. Dandy feather plumes swept back from pointed hats that would neither stay on in a wind nor warm their heads and ears. The mystified Eskimos asked, are you from the sun or the moon? That was the account of the discovery of Etah. Now, what's interesting is on this globe, it marks where Etah is. If you were to look on this globe where Pennsylvania is, it wouldn't list where I'm from. I'm, I come from near Lancaster, Pennsylvania, around 80,000 people in the area. It doesn't list Lancaster. It doesn't list the capital of Pennsylvania. But it lists Etah. Now, in 1818, there was 200 people living there. You know how many people are living there now? Zero. The reason why cartographers will include Etah on a globe like this is because it's now the northernmost point on the face of the earth where they've ever found anybody living. But the reason why people left Etah is when John Ross's ship docked there, people found out something very important. The Etah folks, they found out, number one, they found out that they're not the only ones living on earth. And the second thing, now get this, guess what, they learned this. It's warmer south of there. They probably didn't even have a word for warmer. They learned that it was warmer, and over time, they all migrated south to where it was warmer. Now, here's the application. Once you have come to grace, you don't want to stay in Etah anymore, right? So no wonder the Apostle Paul, in, in the book of Galatians, he's talking to people who are thinking about going back to the law. These are Christians who are thinking, maybe we should have it both. Maybe we should go back to the law. No wonder the Apostle Paul would say to these Christians, who has bewitched you? In Galatians 5 and 1, he says, do not let yourself be burned again with a yoke of slavery. Because that's what the law does. It is a yoke of slavery. Friends, Christ has set us free from the burden of the law and sin and death. So don't live in the law. Don't live in sin. Don't live in dead death. Instead, live in grace. Live in that place of spiritual warmth and spiritual freedom, which is supplied to us only in the love of Jesus Christ and his grace. Amen. Thank you.